The topic of today's presentation, recent advances in application of chromatographic and mass spectrometry techniques in anti-doping testing in international sports. I'm sure all of you who are uh, attending this must have heard at some point of time due to lot of media coverage what this topic generates that so and so who participated in earlier Olympics, maybe 2008 or 2012 got caught when the samples were tested later. So we all are acquainted with the subject in some or the other way and keep thinking what all goes about in the field. So I would try to give a glimpse of the work, what is going on for the last five to six decades in this particular field. The contents of the presentation, some brief of doping, role of World Anti-Doping Organization, classes of prohibited drugs which are banned, testing methods in general, what are there, and then the role of chromatographic techniques specifically, challenges what we face and conclusions, what we feel, how to go about it. This is the lab which I always feel proud of. Like I was one of the founders in 1990 when the lab established, joined there. And from there on to 27 years, I worked in this lab and I owe to this lab whatever I learned during all these years. I got retired in 2016 and was invited to join Anti-Doping Laboratory Qatar, which is really a huge setup. And we are there 150 employees. And as Dr. Rama said, it is something a very well established, very well equipped lab has three floors and uh, the doping analysis lab and the research lab and we do test metabolomics, we do supplement testing apart from the testing of prohibited drugs in sports persons. At the moment, the lab is catering to more than 40 countries. We are getting samples from more than 40 countries. What is doping? I would say I learned about it when I joined in 1990. That's the time I confess I heard the word doping for the first time. And before uh, joining there or before going for the interview, I looked for what it means. Use of prohibited substances or methods for the enhancement of performance in sports is what is doping. It is defined in different ways as per official definition by International Olympic Commission in 1967. Use of any substance foreign to the body and taken with the sole intention of increasing in unfair manner his or her performance in competition is called doping. That was when International Olympic Committee was managing the anti-doping program. It had just begun at that time. Later, World Anti-Doping Agency took over the role of managing anti-doping program across the world. The reason was to harmonize anti-doping rules across the world for every athlete, for every sports, whether the person is in India or US. So to harmonize World Anti-Doping Agency took over. Another reason was the International Olympic Committee was managing sports. So as a conflict of interest, it was required that the anti-doping program should be governed by a different organization. So when World Anti-Doping Agency took over. It 
widen the definition of doping. They said it's not only the presence of prohibited substance in the body, it is tempering while giving the sample. If there is tempering, it is doping. Trafficking of substances, doping. Possession of these substances, administration of these substances to any other athlete like coaches or uh, physiotherapists if they are administering the any prohibited method refusing to give sample is also as a violation and to refuse for out of competition testing because there are whereabouts you must have heard about uh, BCCI there was a lot of conflict not giving the whereabout information. So that also comes into doping. Now these two are added recently, which is if a coach, a doctor or a physio is encouraging or helping other sign player to take is also anti-doping rule violation and prohibited association. Associating with a person who has been found guilty also is an anti-doping violation. So it is broadened to 10 categories, 2.1 to 2.10 of WADA code. Role of World Anti-Doping Agency. World Anti-Doping Agency it was established in 1999 and it initiated from 2000 its anti-doping program. It had three levels. Level one is a world anti-doping court, which was responsible for harmonizing the anti-doping efforts by giving policies, rules and regulations like it's a document which governs everything about the anti-doping program. Then there is a level two document, which is the international standards, which tells to, we'll go into these in our later slides, what all international standards are. Then level three is models of best practices, which are the guidelines. It's not mandatory, but these are the guidelines, if followed, are preferred, these two are essential to be followed. So the role to monitor anti-doping activities worldwide in compliance with WADA court, to harmonize anti-doping rules in all sports in all countries by all international federations and all national anti-doping organization and to provide accreditation and monitoring of laboratories which are engaged in anti-doping analysis. In the context of India, like the National Anti-Doping, uh, National Dope Testing Laboratory is the one which got accreditation in 2008 by WADA, and National Anti-Doping Agency, which is Indian NADA, which is responsible for collection of sample from various uh, athletes across the country. Recently, last year, BCCI also came into the ambit of Nation Indian NADA with the responsibility of collection of samples. So NADAs are practically all across the world. There are more than 200 national anti-doping agencies but there are only 30 laboratories across the world. So one particular NADA in a country is taking the benefit of analysis from the laboratories in the region. That is how at the moment Qatar is getting samples from more than 40 countries. These are the harmonization in anti-doping by WADA. As I said, this is the code the fundamental universal document and the international standards which give technical and operational requirements which are mandatory for all anti-doping organization. Then we have these five standards which are 
prohibited list which is released every year any revision in the list comes by september of a particular year like the 2021 list would come to the laboratories in september this year so that labs get time to develop if there is any new method any addition into it testing and investigation standard which is by the nardos followed for sample collection this international standard for laboratories which we follow therapeutic use exemption if an athlete needs to take medicine like any one of us athlete is also a human being like us who would require medicine for treatment so this is a document which governs the process how they can take what exemptions are needed when they have to apply for it this international standard is about protection and privacy of personal information of athletes as i said at the moment 30 bad accredited laboratories across the world six in asia i have the privilege of working both in india and qatar other labs in the region are china korea japan thailand at the moment both india and thailand lab are suspended for anti doping activities due to certain issues and it would take some time to regain accreditation that's how the samples from both india and thailand at the moment are coming to qatar so aim of anti doping program is that all doped athletes are caught and no clean athlete is wrongly accused that is the aim for all of us to follow to be extremely careful about our testing protocol to be fair with the athlete how so our motive is because the samples are both urine and blood what we test ultimate motive of the anti doping program is to achieve a negative test that means a success of a anti doping program is to achieve this how to achieve this is by effective drug testing which is a main deterrent education so that they don't really take drugs intelligence testing picking the right athlete at a right time for testing which is very important retrospective testing as you must have heard of the samples of uh, earlier olympics so the, all these samples from previous olympic games are stored in lucerne switzerland lab and with on the basis of some intelligence these samples are retested after 4 years 5 years or because we are supposed to store for 10 years for retrospective testing and for this there are two ways one to test these samples physically another way is now with the technique of like uh, a high resolution mass spectrometry the labs which are following they can further get the information from the data review if there is any new drug the protocol what we used to follow in national dope testing laboratory routine sample testing research samples quality control and proficiency testing samples and routine samples both in national and international uh, what we used to receive this was visit of uh, wada science director olivier rabin to the lab before uh, commonwealth games classes of prohibited drugs prohibited list so the it's very tricky to really understand the prohibited list it has uh, various pharmacological classes 
the drugs which are based on those classes, the drugs which are prohibited in both competition and out of competition and which are only in competition and certain drugs which are prohibited in particular sports. So how do we really understand this list? We know there are more than 300 drugs which are prohibited. So there is really a key to understand the prohibited drug list. How does a drug comes into the prohibited list? As I said, every year there are certain additions into the prohibited list. There are certain deletions into the prohibited list. So there are various stakeholders who are working all through the year which has a group of medical personnel, research scientists, and other stakeholders. And this is how a criteria is. If a substance has the potential to enhance sports performance or to mask use of prohibited substance or method, based on medical, scientific, pharmacological evidence or field information, either a substance alone or in combination. You must have heard many a times a new drug comes into the list and some top player gets caught and a drug came into the list in January of that particular year and you see certain positives coming in January, February or people are not aware. Oh, we didn't know this is a prohibited drug, which cannot be a reason to be excused. So that is one. And actual, the other reason, potential health risk to the athlete and use of that particular drug violates the spirit of sports. So two of the three criteria, if are met, a drug would be introduced into the prohibited list. And all the criteria have same weight. Classification into the prohibited list cannot be challenged because when it comes into the list, it follows all the opinions of various stakeholders. The list has certain specified and non-specified substances. What are non-specified? All anabolic agents and hormones. How do we say non-specified and specified? Specified are the one which can be taken for certain medical conditions other than the performance enhancement. It doesn't mean they are less important. It doesn't mean that athlete gets a reduced sanction. It only means if an athlete can prove how he took that drug, if it has all the evidence of a medical condition for taking a drug, and if there is a therapeutic use exemption, the sanction would be for lesser time. For non-specified, it's four years suspension, which can be increased for second offense, can be reduced if some evidence is there but for specified, the sanction is less and it can be increased depending on the substances which are prohibited out of competition. These are non-approved substances, anabolic agents, peptide hormones, myometics, beta-2 agonist, hormone antagonists and modulators, and diuretics and masking agents. Non-approved substances are the one which are still with the pharmaceutical companies. They are making it is in the stage of different trials. And at this stage, if an athlete get access to these drugs and uses, so these are the non-approved substances which has not even come to the market. This is the relevance of the cooperation between pharmaceutical industries. I am coordinating with WADA for this so that we know before a substance comes into the market. Methods, enhancement of oxygen transfer, chemical and physical manipulation and gene doping. So these are the ones in out of competition means 
these are prohibited all the time in competition all the drugs which are prohibited and out of competition in addition the ones which has the advantage to be taken on the day of competition that is stimulants narcotics cannabinoids glucocorticosteroids in particular sports there are few substances alcohol beta blockers when one want these are for these particular sports and beta blockers also for where concentration is more relevant and that's how and we test in the labs we test beta blockers and only in these categories specified as i said are all these cough syrups where when we find any of these we write to the testing authority for a therapeutic use exemption if available so that the relaxation for the result management can be provided by that's not role of the laboratory it is for the testing authority or the result management authority effect of various prohibited drugs on human body that itself is a huge subject i would not be covering here except in brief that stimulants for more stimulants and narcotics were the ones which were initially into the prohibited list when the prohibited list came into force in 60s in 1967 it had only these two categories of drugs later anabolic steroids came into the list in 75 and slowly rest of the drugs came into it as categories and in each categories how the new drugs keep coming into because so the stimulants they are for more aggression more alertness they are taken narcotics to relieve pain for any muscular strain cannabinoids to improve concentration of attention beta 2 agonist for to slow down heartbeat and to have precise coordination which is crucial for swimming events diving and all so we find lot of uh, beta 2 agonist taken at that time hormones and anabolic steroids have all the benefit of muscle strength diuretics to reduce weight glucocorticosteroids for inflammation and rest of the drugs like srms selective androgen receptor modulators which affect androgen res- receptors responsible for muscle fiber growth aromatase inhibitors which are prohibited only in males so in all there are more than 300 drugs as i said in 1967 the list had 30 to 40 drugs and how it got expanded with the expansion the number of drugs increased and the limit of detection got reduced so more work for the labs so this evolution has different phases and there are more demanding testing by more methods longitudinal studies blood testing with faster turn around time anabolic steroids analog soft testosterone with how these analogs came into with 17 methylation 7 methylation 4 5 reduction so with each this we got a new steroids and how these are made definitely there are various chemists working on to making designer drugs and new and new drugs keep adding into the prohibited list and when we see in the prohibited list this is a huge list of only anabolic steroids which has more than 100 drugs and metabolites right into this category testing methods these are the equipment what we have 
I have written here only the chromatographic instruments available. We have Q executives, fusion, LC, orbitrap, elite, triple quadrupole, iron trap, all these LC and the GCs, iron trap, single. These are hardly used now. More of the work is on triple quadrupole, top and IRMS. And ICPMS we do for heavy metals, which is not part of uh, the anti-doping. For currently various detection uh, methodology, initially it was GCMS and um, GCNPT and HPLC. HPLC just we used to use DAD director. Then everything shifted, majority of the drugs shifted to uh, LCMS, CMS, and there are certain complementary methods for the testing of manipulation of blood and blood components, gene doping and peptide hormones. So as you can see, majority of the tests are in on LCMSMS. We have certain uh, detection limits as per World Anti-Doping Agencies, which are given here. So the detection limits are that is a prerequisite for the lab to achieve these. These are not really the detection. It is the minimum required performance limit for the labs to have and less than that 50% is the limit of detection. But the labs are doing much lower than, like we are reporting anabolic steroid at the level of 0.1 nanogram per ml also. So it all depends for a particular lab and its technology to go much beyond the minimum required performance limits as given by World Anti-Doping Agency. For the drugs which are taken at the time of competition, the levels are high because uh, they would be taken on the day of competition. So we don't need to go to the lower concentration for those drugs. There are certain drugs which are to be tested uh, which can be reported only when they cross a particular threshold level. What is the relevance of having those threshold level? It is like salbutamol, which is permitted as inhaler. So if somebody has, which is a treatment for a particular bronchial asthmatic problem, but if someone has taken higher than that, as a tablet that is not permitted and that is what would lead this concentration to come. Similarly for others like cannabinoids, like if someone has gone for a party a day before the competition, so may have come across uh, as a passive smoking, so that will not lead to this level. It would not lead to that level if there is a casual intake of this in a party. So it is only when it is taken for the purpose of would affect. That is how these decision limits. Similarly, for cough syrups, cathine, ephedrine, methyl ephedrine, by having a cough syrup, one or two spoons will not lead to these levels. These are, that's how is the threshold levels are given. So chromatographic uh, testing methods, as I said, are chromatographic and certain complementary methods like immunoassays, ELISA, radioimmunoassay, athlete biological passport. But the major role is of chromatographic technique. These were the instrument which we used in 1990, GCNPT and MST. And we used to have in 90, we started lab with three instruments from Agilent. GCNPT was one and for stimulants and narcotics, GCMST for doing anabolic steroids and HPLC for doing diuretics. 
and that is how it used to be that an instrument is labeled with the group of drugs which would be done on that particular instrument and how that was like for diuretics the initial screening on hplc if something is found confirmation on gc msd for stimulants on uh, screening on gc npd and confirmation on msd and anabolic steroids where derivatization is mandatory so both screening and confirmation on mass spectrometry detector later it came to gc msms lcmsms and isotope ratio mass spectrometer which is for the testing of uh, endogen to differentiate between the endogenous and exogenous of uh, the endogenous steroids when taken externally so one cannot say if testosterone level is high that it is my own testosterone level is high now this instrument can differentiate whether you have taken testosterone from outside or it is your own endogenous then from uhplc orbitrap q executive now in qatar we are doing all screening confirmation everything on this we have a doping lab has a set of 6 q executives used for screening and metabolomics has another four which we used for metabolic test and two more are under development which while saying i forgot to include in the numbers so the hplc which was earlier the instrument what we used to have now uhplc with more column advancement with instrumental advancement which reduces time of analysis less solvent consumption and hence sensitivity and efficiency with good resolution different types of analyzers will have this quadrupole mass analyzer time of flight and these are various but the ones which are in use in anti doping science general setup of a triple quadrupole instrument and how many of you would i'm sure are very much familiar with the q1 q2 and q3 how the ion production transport filtering processing is done and finally the detection and uh, separation of compounds in lc and gc then the identification in ms so what is in the ms and the msms so from ms to msms increase sensitivity and from low resolution to high resolution mass increase selectivity extensive research on prohibited substances based on the pharmacology metabolism and elimination methods of doping how we have come into that stenozolol which used to be tested only as 3 hydroxy stenozolol metabolite now we are testing five different metabolites of uh, stenozolol along with the parent drug and it had led to when we introduced high resolution mass spectrometry all of a sudden the number of positives got increased because one we are able to detect many metabolites which have long detection window two the method could detect much lower initially we had the struggle to detect 2 nanogram and now we are reporting at 0.1 nanogram so naturally athletes are also wondering how come the same dose i used to take earlier and never used to get positive and how come now i am being tested positive it had happened you must have read in the newspaper 
an Indian athlete who was tested negative in India. The sample was tested in Cologne lab and was found positive. And lot of media comments come with that, that no, the lab didn't do it properly sort of things. There was nothing wrong in the lab doing. The only thing is lab was able to detect at that time one nanogram per ml, which was the guideline, the requirement by WADA. But the lab where that sample was tested was reporting in picogram level. Urine sample was the same, athlete was the same. Both the labs were doing correctly. The only difference is one was doing much above the benchmark of requirement and the other lab was doing as per that. So the difference between MS and MS MS, so how uh, both can uh, we can have a full scan and the MRM is possible in this selective ion monitoring in both, but the product ion scan, precursor ion and neutral ion scan can be done in MS MS. This is LCMS, uh, this Q executive screening method. How we do on that screening method has uh, data of more than 400 drugs and we take for every drug on one sheet that particular substance along with the QC and these are different samples which are negative. So one particular drug where a QC is there, this is how we review data. See uh, how a new drug which comes into the, this is a uh, example of uh, ectosterone, a new uh, drug which has come into the monitoring list in 2020. And uh, there are two labs which are working uh, aggressively on this particular drug, the Italy lab and Doha lab. So how we, uh, how the drug came into the prohibited list in the monitoring list and few labs were asked to do into the monitoring this uh, to develop a method and then to do into the earlier samples or maybe the samples now, whether it is being abused and based on our data, the drug may come into the prohibited list from next year. How we develop the method on uh, GCQ top and LC this Q executive and the parent drug and the metabolite, how we get into identifying probably these would be the metabolites and the same we did on GCQ top and then on LC parent and the metabolite based on the polarity, how we could differentiate uh, on both the drug and finally developed a method, did prevalence study on 1000 samples, found it eight samples as positive. Now this data from our lab and Italy lab would go into the thing for consideration and this may come into the prohibited list. Some other designer drugs, how they come and how methods are developed for those drugs. What is the chromatographic criteria to say that a drug is finally it's positive in a sample? This is by way of the retention time, relative retention time, what should be the thing and the tolerance window for a particular uh, ions, the base peak and the other ions. And finally, this is how we create based on our data. This is how we create. These are the transition. This is the area. This one is base peak. These are the other transitions and we put all that data. Once it is accepted, signed by two analysts and it is reported as positive. 
So just finding a peak will not be a criteria if it is not accepted for any of these transitions. We cannot report knowing very well athlete may have taken, but it has to fulfill the required. So when we do even at 0.1 nanogram, this kind of criteria is followed. This is for GCMS screen, oxandrolone, long-term metabolite. This is for LCMS for uh, tamoxifen metabolite. What are the challenges what we feel uh, into the testing and the collection of samples? The challenges are while screening, we have to give results in a very short turnaround time, like during Olympics, during major games. Testing is to be done within 24 hours, results are to be given. I have contributed for uh, London Olympics and Rio Olympics. And I used to see like every day we are getting 100, 200 samples and how the teams are divided into working in three shifts too. So at that time, the short turnaround time, lower limit of detection, analyst with different properties like and so what it needs sample preparation should be good instrument should be sensitive and we should be able to do fast and dedicated manpower so to meet these challenges difficulties in detection it should be sensitive sensitivity means i can see it selectivity it is not endogenous. We should be able to differentiate. So what is effective sports drug testing? That we need to keep updating our testing methods by expanding more number of drugs in a single method, by continuously improving our extraction procedures, so as to explore finding new target metabolites. How we achieve? The progress is in 1970s when the concentration at which we used to detect was much higher and there was more dissimilarity between the drugs. It was easy. Slowly, the concentration became lower Similarity of the drugs like endogenous, exogenous became similar and it became more difficult to analyze. How now we deal with that challenge by having sensitive and fast methods by using single extraction. As I said earlier, extraction used to be different for diuretic stimulants anabolic steroids but now as a single extraction whether it is liquid liquid or solid phase extraction involving all basic neutral acidic drugs followed by gcmsms lcmsms or hrms method there are very few labs which are focusing totally on hrms like i had seen in london olympics all high resolution in Rio Olympics, all high resolution. And many of the labs have now switched over to this, but still every lab would not because it requires a lot of resources. So it takes time. So the anti-doping strategy to meet these challenges, how we plan, how we, what kind of intelligence is required more positive test with the IOC retesting program than in the Olympic Games. More and more anti-doping organizations are using long-term storage as a small smart storage. We get requests from International Federation of Cycling, from various other athletic federation to keep the samples from long-term storage. So labs have to be equipped to store the samples for long-term. Like earlier, it was only Olympic Games samples which are 
store which were stored and which were in Luzon. The samples were transferred. Now, for any every accredited lab, a request comes from the testing authority to store their samples. We need to be seeing the cost effectiveness of the storage program. And secondly, about the WADA cooperation with the pharmaceutical industry regarding the development of new drugs. To meet these challenges, the advancements like retrospective testing, testing of stored samples using latest techniques, how it was done for Beijing Olympics and London Olympics. And there were many athletes who got positive and uh, the medals were given to the next one. Long term metabolites, because uh, that happens only by doing research, by synthesizing those metabolites, by improving techniques. And it has been done for methendinone, oxymethylone, stenozolol, as I said. Gene doping test. There is a lot going on about the gene doping test. In Rio Olympics, we had seen the lab which was equipped for doing gene doping. The method was developed, but at the last minute, it wasn't introduced. And they were all planning to have it in the Tokyo Olympics, which unfortunately got postponed for due to COVID-19 situation. We all are aware. Orbitrap technique to obtain, one is to obtain routine data which can be analyzed concurrently as well as retrospectively in sports testing, especially designer stimulants and structural derivatives. Improved testing methods to make it positive detecting at lower concentration and lastly about the athlete biological passport. So athlete biological passport is currently composed of two modules, hematological and steroidal module, which is hematological. We will not go into it right now. Steroidal is endogenous steroids in negative samples also are monitored. So see the positive samples is one. This is the only module which is taking record of all the samples being tested across the world for every athlete. And third is endocrine model, which is yet to come. But for steroidal model, it collects information on markers of steroid doping. A athlete may not be tested positive for a particular steroid at that time. But these endogenous steroids, the data collected is an effective means to identify samples which have been tampered with or exchanged with urine of another individual. How these are the markers, these are the testosterone, epitestosterone, androsterone, and how we do it while reporting every negative samples on Adams. This is how it is reported. These are the initial values. Means the screening value of every negative sample has these details. And when confirmation, only when it is done confirmation, if it is positive for something else. How it adds value if the same athlete is being tested four, five, six, seven times. And these values endogenous are showing any issues then the testing authority or the result management authority can track and do target testing for that athlete. Just to give a comparison how it was in the beginning, like the first Olympics when testing was done, how the list was only stimulants, narcotics and few analgesics, 2000 samples were done, the instrument GCNPT and GCMSD. And in Rio 2016, more than 300 drugs and metabolites, more than 5,000 samples tested, and so many instruments involved. So the advancement of drug testing has gone real. I know that the athletes are also advancing, but now 
the testing is very comprehensive just a little bit about metabolomics as a human testing screening tool metabolomics and steri steroidomics methods so we know about there are two kinds of like indirect steroid profiling as we do for uh, testing of athlete samples and seeing what all metabolites it's we are getting for testosterone what are the variables we do these testing and other anabolic steroids what are the biomarkers of other anabolic steroids what are coming in addition there is a metabolomics where we are identifying more than 1000 or 1500 metabolite of various metabolic pathways like lipid metabolism carbohydrate amino acids this was the first paper published from qatar lab on athletes serum we did more than 400 samples what it does is testing of metabolomics which is the only facility in gcc countries it is accredited from metabolon usa and the other facility in the asian region is in china so what we are doing at the moment is metabolomics in elite athlete from different sports discipline to see how it varies from a person in uh, swimming to a shooting or uh, weightlifting and another one how metabolomics in positive and negative samples of athletes to differentiate any changes so what is done in this these are the parameters of lipid metabolism amino acid carbohydrate any other pathways we did a project for wada testing of uh, meta uh, to see metabolomics in uh, growth hormone uh, samples the positive samples or excretion study samples so that was a project we did as a service provider for that so the results can't be discussed that is in the domain of wada but just to give an idea that how far this work is going on from direct testing to indirect testing so i conclude that a combination of gc or lc with ms provides highly sensitive selective and versatile tool for detecting wada prohibited compounds advanced of orbitra based high resolution mass spectrometry becoming popular for ease of retrospective analysis finally metabolomics offers a unique opportunity to track the storage of specific metabolites giving possibility of highlighting unnatural changes in the hormone profile that would be difficult to detect through direct detection approaches i conclude with that i thank all of you for your patience for full one hour and just every athlete has a right to clean sport and it doesn't make a difference whether one is finishing last but it is very important to pass the drug test and not to win by cheating by taking drugs thank you